Good afternoon and welcome to the January lecture in the Wonders of the World or WOW webinar series. The WOW program is sponsored by the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center, which is the all-volunteer organization that sells used books to support the Lafayette Library. And I'm Ellen Reinches, the volunteer coordinator for the Friends WOW program. Our lecture today is presented by St. Mary's College Museum of Art. For those out of the area, St. Mary's is a liberal arts college located in the neighboring town of Moraga. Today's topic focuses on how St. Mary's Museum of Art is addressing the issue of increasing the representation of women in museums. Our speaker today is Britt Royer, who is the marketing and membership manager at the museum. Before we begin, I'd like to bring you up to date on the Lafayette Library, which is one of the 26 branch libraries in Contra Costa County Library System. Lafayette Library continues to be open for curbside pickup of books that have been placed on hold. And I'd like to especially commend our library manager, Vicki Shaka and her staff for their invaluable continuing service to the community during these difficult times. The Friends of the Library have traditionally hosted the WOW lectures and the Sweet Thursday author events in person. However, with no public in-person programs being held in the library complex, the Friends moved these programs online through two webinar series last fall. The Friends of the Library have traditionally hosted the WOW lectures and the Sweet Thursday author events in person. However, with no public in-person programs being held in the library complex, the Friends moved these programs online through two webinar series last fall. We are in the process of scheduling new webinars, and here are a few coming attractions. On uh, Wednesday, February 10th, the Fine Arts Museums uh, will deliver a lecture entitled Revelations, Art from the African American South. In 2017, the Fine Arts Museums expanded their collection of African American art with the acquisition of over 60 works, including paintings, sculptures, drawings, and quilts from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. The lecture explores uh, the artists and their works. Sweet Thursdays, uh, we have three scheduled. On Thursday, January 21st, uh, next week at 5 p.m., Sweet Thursday will host Bryant Terry, who will discuss his book, Vegetable Kingdom, The Abundant World of Vegan Recipes. And on Thursday, February 11th, uh, Sweet Thursday will host S.A. Cosby, uh, with his book, Blacktop Wasteland, which is an award-winning mystery th uh, thriller. And on Thursday, February 18th, Th Sweet Thursday will host Dr. Barbara Madison Horowitz, who will discuss her book, Wildhood, which examines the commonality of human and animal adolescence. Uh, on March 10th, WOW and Sweet Thursday will collaborate uh, with a discussion with um, Bay Area author Marilyn Chase, uh, and her recent book, Everything She Touched, The Life of Ruth Asawa. Ruth Asawa became a major 20th century American sculptor and her work is featured prominently at several sites in San Francisco. And this will be in the WOW time slot on March 10th at 2 p.m. We do have a um, um, YouTube channel if you've missed one of our webinars at tinyurl.com friends-llc-youtube. We asked you to uh, use the Q&A function today uh, for typing questions, and then we will answer a selection at the end. If you're interested in learning about um, more events at the Lafayette Library, you can get our, on our, onto the um, Saturday morning email blast at llcf.org forward slash subscribe, and that will take you to the form to fill out with your name and email. Alternatively, if you want to hear about uh, more events on Contra Costa County, you can go to their website, cccolib.org, and filter on uh, locations, events, or age groups, and that will whittle the list down for you. 
The Friends of the Lafayette Library have sold used books for many, many years uh, to support the library activities. And these include expanded Sunday hours, purchase of books and related materials, supporting library programs and our programs for all ages, and supporting our partners in the library. Uh, currently, the Friends Corner Bookshop is open for curbside pickup. We have an Amazon store that is also open. However, we're not able to accept donations at this time. If you'd like to learn more about the Friends of the Library, you can go to llcf.org forward slash friends slash, not slash, hyphen, book hyphen shop. And this will uh, give you information about how to do the curbside pickup and also find the all important shop Amazon button. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, Britt Royer. Uh, Britt is an interpretive storyteller, art educator, and museum enthusiast. She's ac academically trained as an art historian and holds a double BA in art history and anthropology and an MA in art history from the University of California, Davis. Her research focuses on American art in design, architecture, and material culture in the 19th and 20th centuries. Britt has worked in the education departments at the De Young in San Francisco, the Denver Art Museum, and the Clifford Still Museum in Denver. Britt joined St. Mary's College Museum of Art in 2018 as the marketing and membership manager. So take it away, Britt, and I will stop sharing. Hi, um, so let me get our slides going here. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, so first off, I would like to thank Ellen for inviting me to speak today and for organizing this lecture. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Britt Royer and I am the marketing and membership manager at St. Mary's College Museum of Art in Moraga, California. Today's discussion will be exploring the topic of women representation in museum practices, specifically resources and collection development at St. Mary's College Museum of Art. Um, before I dive into this fun and exciting topic, I do want to share with you some information and background on me as well as St. Mary's College Museum of Art. Um, also, as a full disclosure, this is my very first webinar I have ever given. So very new and you are all my guinea pigs. So I apologize if I end up doing some strange babbling like I currently am, and hopefully it will be a fun experience for all of us. So um, a little bit about me, as Ellen mentioned, I have my BA and my MA in art history with a focus on American art and culture. My graduate thesis work um, looked at a regional point of interest, um, Arthur Frank Matthews. He was a designer and artist and after the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, he angled his artistic career to integrate architectural ideas of the city beautiful into design identity and rebuilding San Francisco, which he saw as complete through the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915. I have a photo of him right Right here on the left with his students at the School of Design in 1893. Um, as some of you might know, Arthur Frank Matthews was married to an artist as well. Her name was Lucia Matthews and she contributed many works to their furniture business. Early on in this graduate research, I felt um, I considered including Lucia into my interest. Um, at the time, I was feeling a little flustered because I couldn't find that much information on her, and I eventually decided not to. This is something I reflect on quite a bit now as I generate resources around women artists in our permanent collection at a college art museum. My goal is to care, share, and provide resources for future scholarship that will enrich history by including work of women into this overall narrative. As a side note, um, when I was working on this research, um, spending a year studying this guy, I'm like, I'm going to adopt a dog and I'm going to name him Arthur Matthews, right? The ultimate power move. Um, like many dreams, that did not come true, but I did recently join the COVID dog club ownership and I adopted this little one on the right who I named after an equally talented artist in her own right, um, Goldie Hawn. 
So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, on for the museum. So we are located in Moraga, California on the St. Mary's College campus. Um, SMC MOA is the only accredited art museum in Contra Costa County. In 2016, we became a mission free to better align with our institutional um, missions and goals. We hold a variety of exhibitions, including traveling exhibits, highlights from the permanent collection, as well as contemporary and emerging artists in California. We care for over 4,600 works of art and objects in our permanent collection. Pre-COVID days, um, we were open to the public five days a week from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Wednesdays through Sundays, with public tours offered twice weekly and evening and afternoon programs. Formerly, we were known as the Hearst Art Gallery. In 2011, we had our third expansion, which included an increase of 40% of our storage facilities and gallery spaces. And that's when our name switched over to the St. Mary's College Museum of Art, um, SMC MOA, and also MOA as we're known on campus. So um, early on in 2019, we revisited our mission statement um, and worked to reframe our language to make sure it was up to date. And I would like to share that with you today. SMC MOA acts on the belief that art illuminates our lives and creates a more humane world. We affirm our institutional mission to develop the whole person. We are committed to fostering curiosity and wonder through exhibitions, collections, and programs. We bridge regional art interest in the world. We're very ambitious. And um, we cultivate cultural discovery, bringing people and art together. Okay, so the William Keith Collection. St. Mary's College of California began collecting art in the early 20th century. We're founded by Pro Professor Brother Cornelius Sprague in 1934. SMC MOA is most known for the largest comprehensive comprehensive collection of William Keith paintings. William Keith, um, 1838 through 1911, was a leading artist in California during the late 19th to the early 20th centuries. As with his contemporaries, Georgia Ness, Winslow Homer, um, Keith's style of painting gradually evolved throughout his artistic career. At the beginning, his style was very accurate and detailed, um, descriptive of specific spaces, and places similar to characteristics of the Barbizon School. Um, later, his style shifted to express and evoke feelings through the use of color and mood characteristic of tonalism. We care for approximately 180 works, as well as his archival papers and materials. Um, much of this collection was researched, organized, and conserved through the work of Brother Cornelius Bragg with assistance of Mary McHenry Keith, which we'll speak about in a little bit. Um, as a professor, Brother Cornelius Bragg ended up writing The Old Masters of California, which was this huge biography on Keith. So picture it on the left here, we have Sierra Forest Dreams and Sunny Peaks, um, 1880. And then on the right, we have a Keith pitch photograph of Keith in his full on swagger. And below is a work of Lagunitas in Spring. Both of these paintings are actually oil on canvas. And I was kind of shocked to find out the Lagunitas on Spring was um, oil on canvas. It kind of has a pastel feel to it but it speaks to the scope of how many works we do have in this collection and also emphasizes this element that it is regional specific. So from an education perspective, it's always really fun to connect that when you speak about his work. Okay. Okay, so diving in to today's topic full on, why is the representation of women in museums important? I'm gonna start with this um, quote that I actually pulled from the um, National Museum of Women in the Arts, Get Bats. I'm gonna read it for you all right now. So the truth is that women have never been treated equally in the art world. And today they remain dramatically underrepresented and undervalued in museums, galleries, and auction houses. Counting and quantifying won't solve discrimination, but statistics are useful for understanding the scope of the problem. As NMWA director, Susan Fisher Sterling says, people in the art world want to think we are achieving parity more quickly than we are. 
So I think this is a great place to start because in 2018, um, there is this illusion that women, since they are so dominant in the art field, are equally represented. And what we know from these statistics that the National Museum of Women in the Art shared is that this isn't necessarily the case. And I do wanna share a few of these statistics that are listed on this website and you're welcome to explore more of these. Um, I became aware of them in late fall 2019 and they're digestible in a way that they're gathered together and you can see where those sources are from. So a data analysis of 18 major US art museums found their collections are 87% male and 85% white. Women make up a majority of professional art museum staff. Despite recent gains, they remain underrepresented in leadership positions. The good news is that in 2005, women ran 32% of museums in the United States. They now run 47.6, I'll bet many of them with the smallest budgets. Women earn 70% of bachelors of fine arts and 65 to 75% of masters of fine arts degrees in the US. Though only 46% of working artists across all art disciplines are women. Okay. So um, what are the ways we can acknowledge this disparity and do better? This is kind of a key question and it's really central and always on the horizon. I don't think this is one of those questions that you can put on your to-do list and check off right away. Um, it's ongoing and it needs to be integrated into daily and long-term strategic planning and practices. This year uh, has been challenging for museums in many ways, um, not only due to current trends, but also with COVID, um, with reduced budgets and staff. So when I tackled this question, I try to focus on what we can do now, um, what we have available, and then think through how this impacts our long-term planning for the future. So today I'll be sharing just a few ways that we are integrating this question into our practice and what this looks like in terms of deliverables and representation. Okay, so this slide provides a brief overview of the four main points that I'll be touching upon today. And I'll give you a brief moment to look at those um, before I dive into the next one. I'm gonna take a little sip of water. Okay, here we go. So researching, creating, and integrating resources about work in the collection by women artists to share in digital spaces. The first point I would like to touch on is this one, and I'll go into a few examples how each part of this are essential. Researching to find those connections and the stories, creating, understanding your audience and the market, and then integrating. The fact that at some point these need to be artists in our collection and not labeled as women artists. Okay. So here is a video of one of the exhibits that we had opening in February 2020 called Feminizing Permanence. And you can see what this looked like in one of the galleries of where it was installed. Um, this exhibit featured 40 women um, artists through 40 of their works from our permanent collection. The ex exhibition was a collaboration with the Department of Art and the students in the issues of modern art from the previous fall 2019 semester. Now, <laughs> with shelter in place going into effect about a month after the opening of this exhibit, we closed our doors to the public on March 16th. Um, and after this, we basically had to reconfigure how we were going to approach this exhibit and share it with our audience. Coming from my perspective in marketing, we had all of these different works um, that needed further research. And my thought process was, what are the ways that we can generate resources that can be leveraged as points of entry into art and engagement? So really thinking through the ways to share the voices and the stories of the women in the exhibit to the public. What are some natural points of entry? So I wanted to share with you one of the examples and the first project that really came out of this. And on the screen here is a beautiful watercolor by Mary Elizabeth Parsons 
um, that is a recent acquisition into our museum collection, but you might have noticed it on the walls in that clip because it is in that first gallery space. So some of the things that we know about Mary Elizabeth Parsons, this artist, is that she was born in Chicago in 1859. We know that she studied art in San Francisco in the 1890s, and that actually her sketch partner was Alice Brown Trittenden, who is also represented in the exhibit. More importantly, and what's really kind of fascinating, is that Parsons was known for being the author of an early comprehensive guide to the wildflowers of California. Essentially, she hiked around California with another botanical artist, Margaret Warner Buck, with the intent of researching and publishing a book about the state's flowers. This book, The Wildflowers of California, their names, haunts, and habits was published in 1897. And it was really successful because no other guidebooks like this had been published at the time. And it actually was the number one guidebook and was republished multiple times and used all the way up until the 1950s. So from coming from my perspective, I was really curious about this book and getting my hands on it and to see if there was points of entry that we could share this story. So enters the Wildflowers of California project. Um, so through the Project Gutenberg, this book was actually um, made digitized and public record in 2012. So I created a web page that told a little bit about Mary Elizabeth Parsons and Margaret Warner Buck's research and this publication. And I linked this to the guide that was available through the Project Gutenberg. Along this website platform, I highlighted um, five different entries from that book. So picking five different flowers, for example, I picked poison oak. I feel like that's a good one that we all should be able to identify, um, but also California poppies and a few others that were kind of trademarks of California wildflowers. And that original entry points of what those looked like in the book were outlined on the site. Now, where it kind of got fun is that when you clicked on those images, it brought you to a PDF where those had been photoshopped so that they could be um, downloadable coloring pages that you could then print from home. I love that through this process, I was able to connect a story of an artist to not only regional history, but to regional flora and nature. And that then participants could print this from home and it could go into their own lives. Um, also thinking through the time this happened in March, first time is shelter in place, everything's closed. What's one thing you could still do? You could go hiking, you could go hang out outside. And so this idea of accessibility to meeting our audience at where they were at. Um, stylistically, what was very amazing about these illustrations is that they are beautiful and that they can appeal to a diverse age demographic and not just children, um, but also to college students who are a huge part of our audience and to adults. And so that was just one of the first projects that really came out with this idea of making the collection accessible and integrating it into how we approach daily life and art. Okay, so as these resources continue to build out, um, I needed a platform to put them. <laughs> and so we developed essentially a digital web page on feminizing permanence. On the left here is the original marketing material for the exhibit. And on the right, I have a screenshot of some of these digital resources and how they appear on that web page. On the top, you will notice we have curator cuts. These were basically one to a minute and a half video engagement clips where the curator um, spoke about specific works in the exhibit. They were designed essentially for brief engagement in digital media spaces. Below, we have the feminizing permanence um, selected works from the exhibit. Now, this is a good example in the sense of classic COVID. We did not know if this exhibit was going to be open to the public later or not. And so the idea was just having selected works, not the whole 40. So that way it would be a teaser. You could look at these high resolution images and the original kind of wall text that went with them. And then below, um, Discover Spring. So as these resources continue to grow and expand, 
I realized that they could grow beyond this exhibit and into our overall practice and integration with our collection. So this enters through our museum from home page. This became a pretty popular practice and I'm sure you've seen museum from home pages by other museums as it's one of these integrative ways to bring museums directly into your home. Um, so on the left, you can see we have, it became a place for discovering the wildflowers of California, um, but also in the center, Mary McHenry Keith, the suffragist behind the portrait, and on the right, Passage of Summer. Um, Passage of Summer is an example of integrating women artists into a collection practices, and I'll explain a little bit more about this, um, but essentially the project was a seasonal engagement blog and story platform that explored four works in our permanent collection around the concept of summer. Okay, so here we go. With the passage of summer, so it was fourfolded, three of the artists of which were women, two of the artists were indigenous peoples. The idea was to use this content to build out an archive and a longer shelf life about the work in our collection that could be distributed across various digital platforms. It was curated around the theme of summer, a season that something from a very diverse audience people could approach. Um, it was integrated into this idea of instituting women representation, largely because it wasn't marketed as women artists, but this idea, hey, look at this cool thing in the collection. Hey, guess what? This happens to be a woman artist. Hi, this happens to be a woman artist of color, right? So this idea that we were sharing these stories and these works that had not been previously shared um, through exhibitions or digital spaces. And it was really an opportunity to explore their artistic practice. On the left, we have Summer Hunter by Lucy Quinaku. In the center, we have Birds of Summer by Pisolak Ashuna. And on the right, we have Summer Girl by Helen Hine. Um, these were all stories that were released through the four different months of summer. And you'll notice with the titles on these pieces, they all have summer. So when it comes to artist intent, that was a really nice lineage, right? Because all of the artists, despite being in their different environments, were approaching this artistic creation through this seasonal passage of time. And that became, once again, this relevancy of meeting our audience where they were at as summer in California. Um, and thinking through this idea. Okay. So um, moving on to our next point, reframing language around institutional history and recognizing credit due. Earlier when I started this webinar, I spoke briefly about William Keith collection and brother Cornelius Bragg. As many of you are probably aware with many great artists, there tends to be even greater women behind them um, that contribute and enable their legacy to exist. Keith was no exception. However, there was no visibility around this. So a core part for us in instituting women representation was to reframe our institutional history and to create this visibility about these particular women, their lives and what they did to make the Keith Collection, the museum, as well as their work as archivists and artists. Okay, so we're gonna start with Mary McHenry Keith. Um, she was William Keith's second wife, and up until 2019, there wasn't much visibility on who she was. So the first thing we did was we wrote her into the narrative of how we told our own history, um, essentially through our pamphlets and our website. And the second point we did was we created a digital platform around sharing her story beyond Keith and the women in women's suffrage movement. So this platform um, answered key questions about Mary McHenry Keith and something you all are probably wondering, who was she? <laughs> so Mary McHenry Keith was an American social justice advocate, most known for her work leveraging women's rights through the passage of the Sixth Star in California in 1911. Um, also, she was actively involved in the Humane Society, the SBCA. Her role in establishing St. Mary's College Museum of Art was that she worked very closely with Brother Cornelius Bragg and that she was responsible for gathering, recording, and archiving Keith's paintings. Um, without this behavior and without this work, we would not have her collection today. So, um, 
with this platform, thinking through the larger story of who Mary McHenry Keith was beyond Keith, it really drew attention to the fact of her role in women's suffrage and history. And so I wanted to share a little bit about this because I found it really interesting and I'm hoping you all do as well. So she's considered the first woman to graduate from Hastings Law School in 1882. And it's because of this fluency in law, it really contributed to her public speaking skills and her work with the Berkeley Political Equality Club. Um, so the right for California, for, for, ugh, for women in California to vote was on the ballot in 1895, and it actually didn't pass. Um, I apologize, it was in 1896. Um, but before this, in 1895, Mary organized this Women's Congress in Berkeley, and that's when she met Susan B. Anthony, and she started regular correspondence with Susan B. Anthony. Now, after it did not pass with women getting the right to vote in 1896 in California, Mary was the one who revamped and retargeted the movement, um, publicly speaking to the right and the need for co-education, centralizing suffrage as a primary cause in women organizations across the state and integrating then modern technologies and devices such as cars and telephones as a way to reach and democratize rural areas. So during the time of her marriage with Keith, their house actually served as a meeting ground for social activists. Um, in the fall of 1911, William Keith actually died prior to this. Then California was granted the right for women to vote. Um, Mary McHenry Keith was elected president of California's Equal Suffrage Association. Um, and that work then contributed to the 19th Amendment and the ratification of that in 1920. So we also provided content around the portrait, which is located here on the left slide. And this was um, represented in Feminizing Permanence. What's kind of fascinating about this portrait is it's actually a copy portrait. So this is a copy done by Carrie Anderson of a portrait that William Keith had done of Mary McHenry Keith. We do not know what happened to the original portrait, but considering this was a copy of a portrait done of a portrait, it's amazing to me how detailed her appearance is because from this portrait, I was able to actually identify Mary McHenry Keith in this photo here on the right where she is centered front and center on the votes for women. Um, so one of the fun ways of thinking about marketing this was through the centennial of um, women's suffrage and the 19th amendment. So we partnered with the library on campus to create a suffrage bibliography that was nonfiction, um, fiction, art and art history, and you could link and download it and go to your library and read these books as just part of that celebration and storytelling. So that was one of the fun, fun ways we did that. Okay, moving on, <laughs> back, back to Keith and his first wife. So Elizabeth Emerson was actually his first wife. Um, she was born in 1838 and she passed away in 1882. And um, she was from that Emerson family, okay? And um, her family moved out to California around 1860. They were kind of on the wrong side of the Civil War there and they needed to get out to California, I suppose. Anyways, um, she married William Keith in 1864. Now, where this gets really interesting, especially in our history, is that history suggests it was um, Elizabeth Emerson Keith who actually taught William Keith how to paint. Okay, so she taught him how to paint watercolors in 1866. He goes on and he wins a bunch of awards, but as you can see from the paintings on the screen now, is Elizabeth was a very talented artist in her own right. And during their time and their marriage, they lived in Boston briefly, her work was applauded for its detail. Um, you can also tell by the subject she painted, she was definitely a product of her time, but they were beautifully done. Um, California wildflowers, this one was represented in feminizing permanence. So this idea of visibility through exhibitions. Um, but then we also have this idea of how her work, um, reproducing it and making it publicly, publicly accessible. So this one, um, 
of this little bird. It is fairly new to our collection. It came in in 2015 and it was originally titled California Quail. I looked at this right away and I am definitely not a bird expert by any means, but I'm like, this is not a California quail. So I initiated a whole dialogue and discussion with all the staff, and you'll notice it now has a very authentic and original title of Untitled. Um, <laughs> anyways, along with this story, we reproduced this work to then have a stationery that was sold in um, the MoA bookstore. So the idea that this image is circulating and it becomes a part of one of the faces of the College Art Museum and work we have accessible. The third point I would like to speak to is extending interpretive resources about her work. And that brings us back to the museum from homepage, like this full circle effect we're doing here today. Um, so this was one of the other portions of the page that was do activities from home. You can see digital puzzles of our beloved um, unknown California quail are right there on the left. And um, lo and behold, those coloring pages, they, they just keep popping up. You can see them right there front and center. And then on the right, we have still life pairings, recipes from history. This is a fun little project where we, we took um, two of Elizabeth Key's still lifes of fruit and vegetables and they were very vivid. And I was thinking, how can we connect these two meeting people where they're at? And so looking through historical archives and finding recipes actually during Elizabeth Key's lifetime that you could do with fruits and vegetables in the portraits. So that was just one way. Okay, so our next point that we're moving to today, right along here, um, is acquiring and collecting artworks by women artists that fit within the museum's collection focus. So <laughs> many of the works in our collection are gifts. As a college art museum with free admission, we have a relatively low operational budget, which means we have a relatively low acquisition budget. Um, many alumni and private collectors gift work to our collection for future scholarship, care, and the development of per permanence. Um, this is a point that speaks to the infrastructure behind museums and is important because it speaks to cultivating relationships to widen the scope of work represented in museum collections. One of the themes that came to light in the curation process of feminizing permanence was one, as a small college art museum, we surprisingly had a solid collection of women artists represented, but also two, it drew attention to where these artworks came from and who were the collectors of them. Okay. So women as art collectors. In 2019, the museum was working on a promised gift of artwork from the art collector and SMC professor, Naomi Schwartz. Naomi passed away in fall 2019 and her partner, Jack, agreed to gift the museum six works of the promised gift early so that we could share them in the 2020 exhibition, Feminizing Permanence. These paintings spoke specifically to California and the history of women artists emerging in the San Francisco region during the turn of the 19th to 20th century. The museum shared this story through drawing attention to the persona of the new woman, which broadened um, the scope of our collection, but also broadened the representation of women in our collection. So there's a screenshot of what that looked like on the left, but then also we have a photograph of Naomi in the galleries with students on the right from fall 2018. Um, one of the points I do want to make is I don't think it's really surprising in any ways that Naomi's collection was largely women artists. What's interesting is many of these artists had yet to be researched or written into the rhetoric of art history. By adding them to our collection, this is a place to start. It preserves history and it creates a place for permanence and a place for scholars to come and look. So these were two of the pieces out of the six that were included in Feminizing Permanence. On the left here, we have one by Helen Catherine Forbes. Her name might be familiar to some of you as she's also known as a muralist and later did a few abstract pieces. Um, on the right, once again, <laughs> circle effect, um, Mary Elizabeth Parsons, this watercolor we are all too familiar with at this part of the presentation. Okay. 
So um, the next point I would like to speak to is collecting work that connects to the collection focus. So one of our museum focuses is California landscape. Annie Lyle Harmon was one of Keith's students. There's a photograph of her here on the left in her studio. Um, we currently have 11 works of hers in our collection, previously have done exhibits with her works, but we have a promised gift of establishing her papers and materials as well as additional works, about 25 additional works to add to our permanent collection. Um, this is coming from a woman art collector, but more importantly, it will enable us to have the most comprehensive collection of her work. Once again, it opens up her work for research and future scholarship. Um, which is a really neat point, even though it still speaks to this idea of the California landscape and the rhetoric and the history of how our museum was established. Okay. So last point today, um, supporting women artists through exhibitions, programs, and collaborations. Um, this point is pretty transparent and it's accessible in art, but once again, it addresses representation and integration into institutional practices. Yeah. So the first element I will touch base upon is programming. On the left, we have an image from a members event back in January, 2020. Um, full circle today, folks. Um, so this was actually a teaser event for our upcoming opening of Feminizing Permanence in February. And essentially we pulled artwork from our permanent collection that were by women artists, but this was work that was not included in the upcoming exhibit. Okay, so this program involved facilitating an evening of dialogue and discussion around this work. It was fun because it was set up as small groups that would then rotate and so you had a chance to be close to the artwork and ask questions and to really observe it in a way that a lot of times you just don't get to, especially pieces that aren't currently on display. Um, on the right, we have um, a program featuring the Art History Babes. The Art History Babes is a contemporary um, platform of four art historians who discuss all things visual culture. This program was initially scheduled for Women's History Month in March 2020, and once again, it was canceled, but we are excited to be rescheduling it for March 2021. What is really neat about it is one of the babes is an SMC art history alumni. So their approach to art history makes it accessible and relevant to younger generations, which is a big key in importance for us at a college art museum. And what's fun is their style is fun, edgy, and digestible. So we're very excited to be hosting them again. Okay. So next we'll be looking around facts about women artists. And I have a few here on the slide that I wanted to share with you once again, circling back to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. On the left, um, nearly half, 45.8% of visual artists in the United States are women. On average, they earn 74 cents for every dollar made by a male artist. The NEA found that as women artists age, they earn progressively less than their male artist counterparts. Women artists aged 55 through 64 earn only 66 cents for each dollar earned by men. Okay, so um, what, what can we do with this, right? So um, on the left is an image from a member's studio visit from fall 2019. It featured an artist that we had currently on display with our fall 2019 exhibitions. What was neat about this um, visit, and I think what's kind of neat about studio visits in general, is it places the art in the context of how it was originally created, right? So when we go into museums, like the artwork has been separated and you are now entering kind of this white cube effect of someone else's interpretation. And what's neat about the studio visits is it really empowers and brings it back to the artist. And so at this point at Diane Rosenblum's studio, members were able to engage directly with her and ask her questions and to see the work she's currently working on, to ask about her process right there. And so this element of dialogue and place that really makes an artist not just a representative of a piece of artwork on a wall, but as someone living and working 
and doing what they love. Hopefully they're doing what they love. Um, <laughs> This image that we have on the right is from our opening of Feminizing Permanence, which um, we invited some of the artists that were still alive and working to engage in a dialogue and conversation. Um, we had Jessica Dunn, Diane Rosenblum, and April Funky, and essentially it was a casual conversation that really explored their experience as women artists. Um, they could speak to their mentors and their development, and what's really neat about this and recording this conversation was that now we have artists speaking about work that had been in our collection long before any of the staff started working here, right? So it provides us more content for um, our collection that can be archived and then carried on. Okay. Okay, so the fun part, upcoming exhibitions. Um, so there's a variety of different ways we've been instituting women representation into the planning of upcoming exhibits. The first one I will speak to is Keith and Kari, which is scheduled to open in fall 2021. This exhibition in many ways is a collaborative contemporary response to William Keith's work. Kari Marlborough is a ceramic artist in the Bay Area. And this exhibit highlights her process retracing and the places William Keith painted over a hundred years ago. Um, thinking through her process of how she responded to the landscapes and the elements of place and how places have changed. So one way that she works is through collecting soil samples and incorporates that as a material into the ceramic responses she makes. Um, it's almost like an archeological revisioning of Keith through the interpretation of an artist that's living and working today. The other exhibition opening in fall 2021 is from our permanent collection, Collective Memory Stone Cuts from Cape Dorset. I spoke a little bit earlier about um, Pisola Ashuna, and we have uh, another work of hers right here pictured. Um, and we'll be revisiting the stories of Cape Dorset. So from the 1950s to 60s, graphic arts were really flourishing in this remote trading post in Canada's Cape Dorset regions. And Collective Memories tells this remarkable story of how Inuit women transitioning from semi-nomadic camps to permanent dwellings learned drawing and printmaking practices to support their families, while also at the same time preserving and sharing a lost way of life for future generations. We are very fortunate to have so many of these prints and stone cuts in our collection. Um, and as a side note, this collection itself was also a gift by a woman art collector. And something that's kind of neat about it and about these stories is a lot of them tend to be multi-generational. So we have um, works also by Pesolek Ashuna's daughter, Napachi Putaguchi, in our collection. And this will be featured in the exhibit as well. Okay. And last but not least is Aesthetic Forces, Nature in the Modern California Landscape. And this is, cross your fingers, um, the exhibit that will be opening in February. At this time, we do not know the extent or if it will be open to the public, but we are very excited about some programs and events that will be centered around it. So this exhibit is going to be my curatorial debut. And um, it speaks directly to California landscape as a genre after William Keith. So before I had mentioned my research had ended with the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915, this is where it picks back up, right? and it extends into um, the California drought. And it's a survey exhibit exploring land scenes through the perception of artists who lived and worked in the California region. Um, the exhibit folds 100 years of cultural and environmental changes into the framework of California land interpretations and the lingering rapport of 17th and 18th century aesthetic practices in the genre of landscape painting. So um, on the left, I have a little moving box <laughs> that's our behind the scenes exploration, which is a gu guided um, look into some of the paintings that will be on February 11th at 3 p.m. It is a free event and I will be leading it and hopefully it'll be a, um, more dialogue than me just talking at you. <laughs> so um, that leads us to our last slide, which is involvement. Um, if you have any further questions that aren't answered today during this webinar through the Q&A, 
feel free to shoot me an email below um, at blr7 at stmarysca.edu. Um, you will also notice um, that if you would like any updates about the museum or any of the resources I spoke to or new resources coming out, feel free to subscribe to our um, email and mail list, which can be located on our main website page. Um, I put a little screenshot of what that looks like on the header, so you're aware of that, and that is on the left. Um, here's also the general museum email for you as well. Okay, so this is where I and Ellen, and I am going to pass it back on over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Britt. That was very interesting and provided an excellent behind the scenes look at kind of how museums are grappling with some of these issues. So I see that there've been a few questions come in. So let me go ahead and start asking you. So uh, one is great presentation. I'm glad the museum is working to advance diversity in art. Are there any plans to include artists of color in the future? Yeah, I'm really glad that that question came up because I think that is something that is very core and important that we're all thinking about at this time. Um, when it comes to that, that is something that we are looking at and we are currently um, exploring and considering. When looking through our limited resources currently, um, you'll notice in a lot of degrees, we're pulling a lot from our permanent collection. And so, for example, even with aesthetic forces and going through and thinking through that curation is working with what we have currently and making sure representation of people's stories in that collection are being told. And so that's just one of the ways, but there are many different ways that we are and will continue to increase that. So actually, it's one of my questions. How about how many new works of art come into the collection on average, they say over a five year period? So I haven't been here for five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a year. Um, or this is a strange year, so it's hard to. Yeah, you know, it completely varies and it depends on the size of the gift. Those questions are something our um, collection manager could speak to more specifically. I, I'm nervous to give a bullet point number. Okay. <laughs> it makes me a little nervous, but I kind of want to say like 10 to maybe. 20 over a two-year academic period. It kind of depends on the year a little bit as well. As I mentioned, a lot of our collection are um, gift-based. Right, okay. And I, I think there was a question that uh, came through about uh, uh, whether this um, presentation would be archived and it will be, it has been recorded and it will be on the Friends YouTube site uh, probably within the next week. All right, any other questions out there? Type away. <laughs> what have you found the most interesting thing about working at the museum? Um, I think it's the scope of discovery. Um, there's a lot of different elements. And I think too, is when it's a smaller museum, you can really dive into these different stories and artists that you don't really know much about. And I think being able to connect all those different steps from the research to thinking through um, interpretation and then thinking through the marketing, all those different steps along the way is a really fun element to my job that I enjoy doing. Uh, so uh, here's a question. Uh, can you explain more about the event on February 11th? Yeah, um, so great question. <laughs> I'll be facilitating that event. And essentially it's like a guided exploration and stories. So I'll be selecting particular works in the exhibit and explaining and telling the stories behind those artists. It's a little bit more engagement based in the sense where I'm asking for your views, your takes and trickling ideas and facts. It's almost like a museum tour um, but it'll be in a virtual space because, you know, we're working with what we got now. Um, but it is neat in some regards because it's strange because Zoom does have its benefits in some ways. You can get kind of closer to works and you're not going to have someone telling you to step back a little bit. You're too close. So um, it'll be kind of a detailed exploration into some of the works in the exhibit and the choices behind including them or strange little facts about them, things like that. Are the Inuit prints available to be seen digitally? 
So that is something we are working on. Actually, when it comes to our entire collection, that is still an ongoing process. Some of them are currently available. With exhibits moving forward, we are definitely planning on having a digital component. And so I'm hoping that that will be a collection emphasis that we hope that we will digitize sooner. We do have a few of them currently available through the resources created, but we definitely need to work and we're going to be expanding that as well. Uh, let's see, do you have any projects at the museum that you personally are leading? Oh, that's like, <laughs> so this, um, <laughs> this conversation, but then also with Aesthetic Forces is a current project. I'm also working on some different ones with students in the museums with creating interpretive devices to share with the community and things like that. So I guess that is also kind of like one of those fun things about a small art museum is there's a lot of flexibility and you have a lot of different hats. Um, I also work on the membership, um, part of putting membership events together, putting all programs together. Um, and now with COVID, it's like a whole um, relaying that framework and starting over and trying again. So, yeah. Um, here, will, you be, uh, will the museum be showing the Andy Warhol collection again in the next year or so? I don't know about the next year, but I'm hoping that we do start having more access points to that collection because it's quite a fun collection. I think it's one of those things a lot of people don't realize that we have Andy Warhols in our collection. And so um, there are usually some different points of digital entry, but because we had an exhibit about that recently, I don't know if that's a focus, Currently, I, I definitely do hope that because it was brought up, it's on the top of our minds and does reoccur soon. So I'm, I'm gonna read one comment and then there's a next question. So the comment is you speak of marketing as an intellectual and outreach activity rather than commercial event. So this, this uh, attendee finds that refreshing. <laughs> there you go. And then the next question is, have you worked with the La Mirinda Arts Council to promote partnership programs with St. Mary's Museum's programming? That is um, something that we're currently working on. So um, we recently have gotten re-involved. Um, St. Mary's College Art Museum kind of had a, a switch with new staff members. And so reestablishing relationships and getting that going is all part of the fun game. But hopefully, yes, we will have partnerships with them more, especially moving forward. And if anyone here is directly involved and has ideas or would like to be a part of those conversations, we are more than happy to have that input and that voice. Oh, and so back to the February 11th event, is, uh, do you sign up for that? Is there a, a like, a, yes. is it a Zoom or Zoom or a different platform that you're gonna be using? So it will be on Zoom and the link is on our website, actually on the homepage. If you scroll down at the bottom, there is a calendar. And if you click on the calendar event, there'll be that link and it just takes you directly to the registration. Okay. All right, well, I think uh, that looks like it's a wrap up for this afternoon. And I'd like to thank you so much for participating in our online events here at the Lafayette Library. And I'd like to congratulate you on your first webinar. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for hosting this, Ellen. It was quite fun. And I hope everyone else had a fairly good time. <laughs> I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. And, and everybody, I hope to see you. Uh, well, actually, I can't see you, but I, I hope you attend our future webinars. Thank you. Thanks.